Hello, Sandra, can you hear me? Yes, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you I well. Can, I can hear you. Are you also able to turn on your camera for me? Yeah, sure. Excellent. Hey, there you go. How's it going? My name is Jason. I'm Encore. I will be uh, taking care of your onboarding and getting you up on the screen. Uh, the first thing I notice right now is you're really low in the picture. Are yeah. you able to sit up higher or lower down your camera? Like that? Yeah, that looks good. Yeah, that looks, that's, that's perfect. That's oh, good okay, framing. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm guessing you've done a virtual presentation before? Yes. Okay, so um, pretty straightforward. Um, I will talk to you in chat once we get going because I won't be able to see because it'll be heard in the meeting. Um, do you have a presentation or anything? No, no, no. no? Okay, excellent. Um, so what will happen is when everything's ready to go, um, I will give you a message in chat um, directly if you see now. Uh, I just sent you a message. Can you see where your chat came in? Yes. Okay. Um, you can chat to me there if you need any assistance or anything like that. Just reach out and uh, I can give you a hand. And um, once we get going, I'll give you all a thumbs up to let you know that everything's working good um, through the chat. Perfect. Um, so do you have any questions for me? No, I think it's, it's pretty clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Uh, just one, one more thing I ask of you is if you could just leave your camera on. That way I know if you're around and whatnot. Like, feel free of to course. wander away if you need to step away from camera. But if you could leave your camera on so that we know you don't have any massive connection issues or anything like that, that'd be fantastic. Of course. Yeah, yeah, no problem. If there is any issue with connectivity because, you know, sometimes happens, I'm assuming they would just switch to another speaker, correct? Yeah, 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 I'll, I'll switch you out and all that stuff and I'll switch you around, yeah. Perfect, yeah, that's perfect. I'll keep my camera on, no problem. Excellent, well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to mute my microphone now. Um, and yeah, um, I uh, yeah have a uh, good presentation and be sure to uh, contact me if you need any help. Thank you, thank you very much. Bonjour, Mariam, how are you? <laughs> Bonjour, ça va bien? <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you too.
too. But I was cheating, and I just found that out. So I'm, I'm going to look at it. Yes. Are we in? Is everybody in? Bueller? <laughs> That's a Gen X thing. Not many people who aren't Gen X get that one. So I want to welcome you all here um, for our second panel. Um, we are here. I'm going to let our esteemed panelists introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, but just to do a quality check that you are in the right room, we are talking about health and the SDGs. Everybody in the right place? All right, excellent. Um, the other discussion is economic development. If you are in the wrong room, you can, you can sprint over there, but hopefully everybody's here. Um, 
And I'll just give a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today. And then, as I said, I will switch over to our panelists. Um, this panel is going to outline the challenges and opportunities. I like it when we do both. Sometimes we just do challenges and we stop it there, don't we? And it feels all, oh, wow, we've got a lot of challenges. So I like that there's opportunities in this discussion. Um, the challenges and opportunities that exist at the intersection of Indigenous health and the United Nations SDGs. We'll be exploring the multifaceted challenges faced by Indigenous populations in accessing quality health care. Panelists will discuss strategies and solutions that promote inclusivity, empowerment, and holistic well-being. I can't wait to hear this one. This is going to be great. We do have um, two virtual panelists with us today. Um, and um, I will let them introduce themselves. Um, but in the interim, we have um, two esteemed panelists with us here. And I'd like to give both of you a few moments to introduce yourself, and then we'll move to our virtual panelists, if that works. All right, use the mic. Um, it helps people hear, and you might just need to switch it on. Hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is... Uh, <laughs> Hello in my native language, uh, Sami. My name is Susanna Israelson, and I work for the Sami Council. I work as an uh, advisor at our Arctic and Environmental Unit. So climate and environment is my portfolio um, within the UNFCCC, the UN Climate Convention, but also the Arctic Council. I am born and raised in Swedish side of Sápmi. The Sámi people are divided into uh, what is today four countries. So we have Norway, Sweden, Finland, and the western part of Russia, the Kola Peninsula. And I am born and raised in Swedish Sápmi in a town called Vácher in the north. Grew up in a reindeer husbandry family, so the reindeer husbandry is, is very close to my heart. I have a background in political science and in my um, earlier years, which I realize now that my picture is about eight years old, <laughs> so I should, <laughs> um, which is actually from my time when I served as the, the union secretary and then later vice president of the um, Sami youth organization in Sweden, Sami Nora. So that is uh, a little about myself. Gito, thank you. Hello, hello, folks can hear me? Okay, so Ani, bonjour. Uh, my name's Jordan Plain, and I am a very proud citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario. I'm also a descendant of the Tassom Claremont family line of Penetang Machine and of Drummond Island. Um, I always think it's important to locate myself um, and really raise up the names of my family. So I'm the daughter of Al Plain and the granddaughter of Elva Melchon, the great granddaughter of Philippe Melchon, and the great great granddaughter of Malgaret de Somme. Those are all of my Metis family connections um, in my community. I was born and raised in the along the shores of Georgian Bay in the Pen in the community known as Penetanguishene, and I would argue it might be the largest concentration of Métis folks in Ontario. Um, but my community always likes to humbly brag that um, I'm also the fifth generation of Métis people to actually live and work in Penetanguishene. Uh, my family historically has been a long line of potato farmers, um, but I think I've my dad and I have switched things up with uh, working in the mental health field a little bit. Um, I'm the current president of the Métis Nation of Ontario's Youth Council, and I have the honor of also being the youth representative on the Provisional Council of the Métis Nation of Ontario. Uh, outside of politics, I have a Master's of Social Work and, a, and am an adjunct lecturer in the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Toronto. I'm a registered social worker in a psychiatric hospital in my home community where I primarily focus on supporting um, our Indigenous and Francophone clients and subsequently work a lot with uh, therapists who also support Indigenous and Francophone clients. Right now I'm actually seconded to the northern area of our province where I do a lot of work with folks in kind of the Sudbury, Timiskaming, um, kind of that neck of the woods as well. Um, I also have the opportunity to 
work with my Métis community, specifically in the realm of mental health. I, I belong to a private practice known as the Weaving Wellness Center, which is a clinical and consulting um, practice where we work, like I said, primarily with Métis people, but also with uh, First Nations and Inuit folks. I'm the clinical lead there, so I get the opportunity of walking with therapists so that they can become really, really awesome therapists in whatever journey that looks like. So whether it's supporting them in their education journey, listening to recordings to help them improve their skills, whatever it is, I, I have a big passion for making sure that um, our indigenous therapists and indigenous clients have the opportunity to have the best care that they possibly can. Um, and so today, what I'm really gonna come, I think, full circles, talk a little bit about like the intersections of being a social worker, being immersed in the mental health field every single day, as well as hopefully bringing some perspective as a Métis person uh, into some of the conversations. So I'm looking forward to that dialogue. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. And we'll move over to our virtual panelists, if we may. Um, have we got both on the line? Are we live and rock and roll in here? Hi, hello, welcome to our, our panel discussion. Um, we're just um, going through some quick introductions, just three or four minutes if you'd like to take a moment to introduce yourself. Um, why don't we start with Dr. Sandra Del Pino, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. It is a pleasure to be here with you all today, even if it's virtually. I am uh, Sandra Del Pino, Cultural Diversity Advisor of the Pan American Health Organization, which is the um, regional office of the World Health Organization for the region of the Americas. I am based in Washington, DC, and I am very happy to share with you some of the perspectives from all the region regarding indigenous uh, health. I am a human rights lawyer with a PhD in health sciences and have worked with indigenous peoples for uh, several years now, from uh, 2012 at the Pan American Health Organization. And prior to that, I was based in the Western Pacific Regional Office, uh, the other regional office from WHO working with the Western Pacific. And prior to that, I was part of the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So I am very excited to be with you all. And again, I would like to thank you for the time and for this space. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Dr. Miriam Wallet Abubakri, if you would like to introduce yourself. Merci, Tralasem, bonsoir. I'm joining you tonight from Paris, but I'm based in Ottawa, where you are gathering on the Algonquin territory. So I miss uh, all of you there and I wish to be there uh, in person. Um, introducing myself, I'm Tuareg, so I, I was born and raised in Timbuktu uh, in Mali, that is Western Mali, still Western Africa, in the region of West and North Africa, like uh, Sahel and Sahara ecoregions. Um, I, uh, as said, grew up in my own um, education system, my people education system, the Tuareg who are uh, nomad pastor. Um, and uh, I also got the opportunity uh, to uh, face or embrace different uh, disciplines in my uh, journey of uh, uh, conventional education both medical, humanitarian, and education uh, sciences. Um, I got also the privilege to be involved in several uh, indigenous advocacy and UN spaces, including uh, being a, an expert member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples, and also an expert member of that forum. Um, Currently, um, I, I am wearing different hats, including being part of the Indigenous Coordinated Body on the Enhanced Participation, which uh, my two uh, colleagues will uh, talk about tomorrow in the, this uh, summit. 
uh, I also uh, uh, I am more involved also now in the research because I believe that research evidence has power in, uh, to support our journey in ad advocacy for our rights. So I'm co-leading a global indigenous research-led research project named Aramid, which is a holistic approach to health and well-being. I'm also uh, uh, co-sharing a UNESCO chair on the same uh, topic. That's why also I'm here today in Paris. And um, I'm adjunct professor at uh, La Faculté de Droit Civil de l'Université d'Ottawa, where I uh, teach um, the les ordres juridiques autochtones et les droits international. So very briefly, this is who I am, and I'm also a mother of a five-year-old daughter who um, several people in the room had the opportunity to see in the UN uh, while I was breastfeeding her and all. So um, yeah, thank you for having me uh, and having also a panel on health and SDGs. Wonderful, thank you very much. And we will make sure that, uh, just so the two virtual panelists know, we have a list of questions. And the way that we sort of like to do this is, you know, uh, not every panelist has to answer every question, but if you feel compelled by a question, um, let us know, and we'll give you the microphone. Okay. We are gonna get started with our questions. The first question for the panel is um, to talk to us about uh, what you think some of the specific barriers Indigenous communities face in accessing quality healthcare. Again, what are some of the specific barriers Indigenous communities face in accessing quality healthcare? would like to grab the mic. Ooh, we got a grabber. All right, you can go ahead, uh, sure. I can, I can start us off. Um, so I, I shared a little bit earlier, I work in a, I should clarify, it's a forensic psychiatric hospital. So I'm immersed, I think, every single day in recognizing um, and listening to clients around like the barriers that exist around them accessing um, quality healthcare, particularly in a mental health lens. And the two things that come up quite frequently from the clients that I, I support is one, it's that the socioeconomic factors that really hinder their ability to exist in some of the mainstream programs. Um, an example is I work in a government supported program, it's called the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program, and we're mainly targeted at increasing accessibility to psychotherapy for all folks, particularly priority populations, which include indigenous, BIPOC folks, um, gender diverse folks. The issue is that the government has a kind of narrowly made like very specific inclusion criteria, which actually inadvertently exclude all of our priority populations because it requires a mandatory kind of like period of stabilization, which for a lot of our folks, particularly indigenous folks, some things like housing, access to food, we have to go to work. Some of these things are just very large socioeconomical factors that cause an inadvertent barrier to them accessing and continuing to access services. The other thing that I think a lot about is the like the inequitable funding um, and non-long-term sustainable funding that exists in a lot of these spaces. Um, another example, I'm, I'm currently a priority populations clinical consultant and any of the work in my hospital that I do that is focused on Indigenous people is actually all contract to contract. There's no permanent mechanisms that exist within my hospital that I work at that allows for long-term sustainable funding for folks that want to do this work around taking down those barriers. We, we recognize the barriers that exist, but in, able, in order to make those changes, sometimes we also then have to be able to uplift and support long-term sustainable funding, not just for the programs, but also for the staff that help support those programs. Um, so I think those are Thank the two you. key things for myself. Okay, other panelists who would like to jump in on answering this question? Yeah, please go ahead. So I can keep it um, short, but um, national statistics uh, in the Nordics do not disaggregate data based on ethnicity. So there is very few data on 
on the health of the Sami people and that not that much research on the topic either. But some studies have found that psychosocial health among Sami is sometimes worse than among the majority population. And some studies also point towards that reindeer herders are particularly, particularly vulnerable. Um, so in Sami, apart from the healthcare being um, sometimes only accessible in the central places, like very centralized um, and far from remote communities, um, including lack of acute health uh, services. Um, there is this huge, uh, there is a lack of, of cultural competence within the healthcare in general, and I guess that's very common uh, all over, not only in, in, in our region, but um, the lack of cultural competence is, is very clear, but also um, the language barrier in, in healthcare. We have this system in Swedish SAPMI um, where municipalities, um, some municipalities are compelled to, to have uh, some um, services made available in one of the in the five minority languages where Sami is one of them, but, but that is um, not always met, uh, I could say. Um, but also national authorities, they, they don't recognize our needs for specific health care and cultural safety. The Nordic idea is kind of built around this one shoe fits all. Um, which means that equal health care does not deliver equality in, in what is actually delivered, which means that you know our, our needs are not met. Um, but we have some great initiatives uh, in SAPMI that I could speak more about later. We have SANKS, which is um, the SAMI National Competence Service for um, Mental Health Care and Substance Abuse on the Norwegian side of SAPMI. And they have satellite offices uh, in several locations across Norway. Um, but this is not available on the Swedish or Finnish side of SAPI and not on the Russian side either. Um, but generally, we have um, a long journey to healthcare. It's very centralized. We're also people in four countries. So healthcare and these various national initi uh, initiatives differ. And we also saw under the pandemic, uh, how clear it became that our people, in fact, do live, work, and function cross-border, and how how we were negatively affected by the closed borders and, and lockdowns that um, came with socioeconomic consequences, but also separated families. But I would say, um, I, I promise to keep it short, <laughs> we see the, the lack of, of cultural competence in healthcare and understanding and overall, this lack of recognition of colonial history and then current power imbalances. Um, yeah, okay. so thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to, yeah, that's right. Okay, we've got a hand up. I was hoping that that would be the way that it would go. Dr. Del Pino, you have your hand up. Would you like to answer the question? Sure, just to compliment, because I have much of what the former panelists just uh, said, and it's very much in line with some of the challenges we've been facing for the region of the Americas. Probably another one I'd like to, to highlight um, is the lack of recognition of ancestral and traditional medicine. We've been observing this quite a lot. And also the lack of culturally um, adequate health services, which at the same time provoke a mistrust by indigenous peoples to go to uh, healthcare facilities. And we also have several initiatives in place who have shown, which have shown to be quite successful, always with indigenous peoples. I also would like to emphasize now that, that the former speaker was, was mentioning on, on the lack of disaggregated data. The variable of ethnicity is not included homogeneously and therefore, in many occasions, we do not know what are the prevalent diseases, what are the main causes of death for indigenous peoples in the region. So in maternal health, in the field of maternal health, there are many interesting experiences to promote culturally adequate 
health services. And I think we can talk maybe later about that. Just to compliment, thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctor. And Dr. Abubakreen, you have your hand up as well. Yeah, thank you. I think that uh, my co-panelists already touched on, on most of the things that I wanted to highlight. But if I can add uh, something like we are, we heard um, uh, the unrecognition of indigenous medicines in the healthcare systems, uh, because we know that in some areas, still the healthcare systems don't get to there, but there are people practicing uh, their own medicines. And we see um, several issues or challenges with that. Those medicines are not uh, transmitted in some uh, areas because uh, they are undervalued. There are no uh, specific uh, ways or the ways that, that the knowledge is regarding our traditional medicines are not transmitted. So uh, the chain of transmission is uh, broken. So we need to see revalued our tra traditional medicines, our medicine practices, but not only sitting in remote areas, but shared uh, as um, equal medicines and practices in also the conventional setting, uh, because now uh, we have to acknowledge that indigenous peoples are not only in remote areas, so we are everywhere. We are in Ottawa, uh, we are in up north, uh, where there is, uh, we can just reach by skidoos and flights. So these are realities we have to adapt also. Uh, if I may add another point is, um, the, um, uh, is the lack of training, not only as my co-panelists said, like in terms of cultural competency, but even uh, 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 lack of means given to indigenous students. If you have to to pursue your education in some situation, uh, either in, uh, in Canada, like across Canada, but also uh, outside for the other indigenous peoples, you have to go out of your communities if you are lucky or you just have to, uh, uh, um, to give up on your education because there are several, several systemic barriers to, to access education. And when it comes to education in, uh, in health um, uh, areas, fields, uh, it's, it's again more uh, difficult. I remember my own experience. When I, get, I got into the medical school in, in Bamako, I had to uh, literally leave my parents as a young woman, indigenous women, with all the uh, with all the risks that it takes for a woman and indigenous women or woman to be in urban setting. You understand. So uh, we need more um, uh, openness, uh, more facilities for indigenous students, young, who want to be uh, trained in, enrolled in those kind of programs, either nursing, uh, I don't want to cite them, it's a very wide range of, uh, of prof nice profession, but where we need to have more indigenous uh, students being uh, enrolled. So this is also the over challenge because we are hearing the issue of retention also, keeping the indigenous training in their uh, area and the lack of having uh, the competency, the cultural competency. So one of the solution is to, uh, uh, is to train ourselves to, to be those who are going to uh, provide healthcare to our own people. It takes a lot of investment but that is one of the radical solution uh, to, uh, to, to come over uh, these kind of barriers. And the high cost also of healthcare, um, because we have to think uh, what it takes for someone, even in the context of Canada, for example, when you come to the southern cities, uh, you have to live a new life, literally. You have to 
break your life from uh, northern city, north, all what you were doing. Sometimes you stay two years, three years, depending in uh, your disease or your illness, and uh, then it, it, it is impoverishing you. So it costs a lot, uh, even if your healthcare uh, expenses are taken by the state, there are some uh, expenses that not valued but that are uh, highly uh, cost uh, in the context of Canada. In other contexts, you have to pay by your own pocket all the expenses also related to your health, which is just impossible for some of indigenous uh, communities because they don't have the monetary uh, power, uh, in, so they, they cannot access to healthcare uh, system. So these are very few of uh, uh, over barriers that I can complement what have been said by my three over uh, co-panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. We're going to move on to question number two. What initiatives are community-driven strategies? No, that's the third question. I skipped one. How can healthcare systems integrate Indigenous knowledge, and what benefits can this bring, not only to Indigenous communities, but to the broader society? Again, that question is, how can healthcare systems integrate Indigenous knowledge, and what benefits can this bring, not only to Indigenous communities, but to the broader society? And in the interests of time, I will probably limit our answers to two to three minutes, um, which panelist would like to uh, take a stab at that answer? Sure, you can go, Suzanne. Sure. Um, first thing that got into my mind when I saw this question, I would start with research, of course, um, and you know the, the existing power imbalance between the Western way of knowing and our way of knowing, and include broader definitions of what is evidence, um, and that is recognized that that the knowledge of our peoples is knowledge and also legitimize our ways of learning and our mythologies. Because I grew up learning by doing, that's, that's how it works. I, I cannot go to, to, to school to learn um, our way of life and, and the ranger husbandry in particular. Um, but I also think that the way, um, measuring individual health through through a narrow set of indicators, which is usually done in healthcare, not specifically, doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but of course it is useful, but it does not capture the breadth and complexity of, of community health and well-being, and, and also fails to highlight solutions. So as central as the knowledge component itself, um, for example, the use of our traditional medicines, so is our worldviews, cultural norms, values, and expressions, food systems, and our internal organization and legal systems. So understanding this is key, and, and I come back to, to cultural competence and cultural safety. But I also want to echo Dr. Yvonne Poitois, um, who highlighted using our own knowledge and our own communities um, in learning um, and to train ourselves, as I, we heard from, from um, the other panelists. So I think that really important would be to strengthen Indigenous people's organizations and our collective work for our people and communities and strength, strengthen and encourage our knowledge holders to work strategically with Indigenous knowledge and in healthcare specifically. And um, some of the research done in SAPMI has also um, underlined that strengthening and protecting cultural identity is also an effective measure. And, and as I, I expect everyone here um, would agree upon, uh, and found that Sami with strong culture, identity, and belonging were expected to be more ready to face the challenges of life and society, which I can sign sign up for um, for totally. So um, it's a big question, but but we need money and and we need resources and and also to add one last point, as climate is mainly um, 
what I work for with in my portfolio. Um, Sami Council uh, produced a report that is called Climate, Ch uh, Climate Change and SAPMI, an overview and a path forward, which I could share with you later. Um, where one of our recommendations is to recognize climate action as a vital part of health policies and health action as a vital part of health, of climate policy. So I think um, as, as we are interconnected with, with nature and our environment, um, there's, uh, we need to start there as well. Um, yeah, I could stop there. Thank you, thank you, Susanna. Yes, I think, okay, sure, we've got um, Dr. Maybe, Abu Kirk. Can I maybe make one comment? You yeah. can, yes, of yeah. course It'll you can. Quick. Yeah, and then we can go, sure. Yeah. No okay, um, one of the things when I think about that question is that came to my mind is community engagement and, in, and empowerment. Um, the healthcare system has done a tremendous amount of harm, I think, to Indigenous people. I don't need to explain that. Um, so I think the healthcare system as, a, as its whole has an uphill battle in building trust with folks, and that comes with community engagement. Sit with us, learn from us, value our stories, our cultural practices, and our ways of knowing and doing, I think will go a long way in how to even start to integrate Indigenous knowledge into this like really colonial system that was actually never created with us in mind. It was created to perpetuate a great deal of harm against us, and so we need to kind of shift that narrative of let's sit with community and kind of build that back up because we can't transform those systems without repairing those broken relationships. Good point, thank you. Dr. Abubakreen, you have your hand up for an answer. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this question and for my two sisters who already spoken about it. Um, adding to what they said, um, I uh, think that uh, I'm sorry for being so critical, but I don't even like the word integrating. I better go with um, elevating indigenous knowledges within the uh, health uh, system or healthcare. Uh, because when we speak, um, coming also from a research perspective, when uh, we do research, uh, with, um, in a very um, diverse setting, we always see the trend of uh, getting a word or a, a, a cut word or concept from indigenous peoples and integrate it in a research frame uh, or in a program what which was already framed um, in a colonial way. So that is what we want to deconstruct. <laughs> so elevating, how can we elevate indigenous knowledges within the healthcare systems? Some of the examples uh, as they share will be revalue, uh, re like giving back value to our knowledge systems in the area of health pure health, as we say it, but also broaden, um, making broader the how we understand health, because the way uh, indigenous peoples, and again, we are not all the same indigenous people themselves are very diverse, but we do see like kind of broadness on how we think health, like a holistic approach uh, to health, which is not only um, like healthcare uh, facilities, um, like a nurse, a doctor, or or a physiotherapist with the stethoscope and uh, diagnosis and so and so, and that's it. The health system for us is broader than that. It takes the people who even bring to our mind the openness and being prepared to receive any kind of uh, 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 healthcare, right? So, where are our spirit? Where are our spiritual uh, practitioners? Uh, where are um, our uh, uh, our practices? So, we want to see all this. So, it is uh, the dialogue or bringing together all all those uh, knowledge uh, systems 
together, not one or another, not unbinded one in another. So that is one thing. Uh, I call it in my language like welcoming indigenous health practices. And uh, bringing indigenous knowledges will also give us more um, comprehensive understanding of indigenous uh, health systems to, um, because um, uh, it, it will give us more understanding, sorry, of indigenous determinant of health. And there is a group now of indigenous, it's a formal group of indigenous uh, practitioner in health globally working together on putting those indigenous determinant of health. So that is also where we can see really ways to bring that and what it bring or it contribute to the whole system and to the SDGs, if we can speak in having a whole picture. It is that very simply, indigenous peoples will be in better uh, health so they can better contribute because we are very, um, we are part of the society. We want to exercise our part as citizens. We don't want to be lagged. We don't want to be those living with diseases, with illnesses, any kind of them. So we want to be fully effective and a full citizen. So uh, uh, that's also a matter in when we do uh, the uh, voluntary national reviews. For example, when Canada do uh, its uh, uh, VNR, they have to take a statistic from everywhere in Canada, not only where it is nice, it is everywhere. So uh, contributing and bringing indigenous people's health at the top will bring uh, the whole nation to the top. So uh, our countries will be truly um, G7 or G3 or G5, <laughs> not uh, talking with some shy when we talk as a G5 nation where some of our citizens are left behind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. We are going to move into our third question um, for any of the panelists to answer. What initiatives or community-driven strategies have proven successful in empowering Indigenous populations to actively participate in decision-making processes related to their health. So I'm going to give you two minutes to answer. I'm going to start getting strict here because we oh. want to make sure we have room for a q and I won't even need two minutes. I okay. think distinction-based programming and decision-making is just like the answer, I think. Um, as a person who interacts with a healthcare system on a daily basis, if it's not a distinctions-based program and it's a pan-Indigenous perspective, I, as a practitioner and as a client, am less likely to want to interact with those systems. And so I think really shifting that narrative of like, this is an all-Indigenous program or this is all-Indigenous funding to this is specifically for Métis folks, done by Métis people, in a Métis way of knowing and doing. Same for First Nations and same for Inuit folks. I think that's okay. plain and simple. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, would you like to? Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. So we have a few good examples from, from SAPMI. We have, as I mentioned, SANGS, which is the Sami National Competence Service for Mental Health Care and Substance Abuse, um, and the Sami Clinic in Karashoka in Norway. This is entirely um, built from Sami individuals um, in the early 2000s. And, and I also have to add that the services that SANGS provides um, are available for Sami in the other three countries, but however, it requires for, for you to go through the, the national health care system first. Um, and like I mentioned, they offer um, treatments um, for mental health and substance abuse and addiction and also um, act as a national competence service function uh, aiming to contribute to ensuring that um, Sami receive equal treatment in mental, mental health and substance abuse um, care. Um, and Sanks and the Sami Clinic now are consulted on Sami health issues on the Norwegian side of Sami um, by, the, by the national authorities. So the bottom-up approach has been integrated into the, the national health system in Norway. 
whilst they still operate um, within national frameworks, um, they also do treatment based on SAMI values. Um, but most importantly, they also train staff and provide relevant work where SAMI cultural competence is a merit and also becomes relevant to our own people who are training in the health sector or, or um, aiming to do that. We also have, on the Swedish side of SAMI, um, where I reside, we have the Knowledge Network for SAMI Health, which, which was established in 2017, who um, want to promote good health and care on equal terms for the SAMI people. So these networks include the regions um, of healthcare. Um, so the Swedish healthcare system is divided into regions. Um, and has built up a network that includes staff with Sami language and cultural skills. So their work is based on a strategy which describes how the regions should develop a language and culture uh, adapted healthcare that takes into account Sami cultural language and the Sami patients' living conditions. So the rights-based approach is a foundation here. Uh, and also, um, central Sami organizations sit at the, the steering committee of this network. And the youth organization that I used to work for has one of these seats. Um, so overall, I would like to, to, to say that Sami health networks, they have promoted research on Sami health, as we do not have disaggregated data on ethnicity. These networks have promoted research on Sami health and health service surveys, such as the Sami Noor, which is a large population-based study. Um, and it has now received funding um, for its third phase, which uh, will fo focus even more on Sami values, the truth and reconciliation process, uh, and possibly the impacts of climate change. So overall, this um, bottom-up work from, from SAMI um, healthcare individuals, but also um, politicians, have managed to put SAMI health on the national agenda um, in the Nordic countries. And in this case, I would say uh, specifically in Norway, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Del Pino, I see you have your hand up for a quick answer. Yes, uh, I'd like to mention uh, a very successful experience from the Pan-American Health Organization, which is actually at the ministerial level for the first time. A policy on ethnicity and health was approved in 2017, and it followed a very complex process of negotiation, not only with ministries of health, but also with uh, indigenous leaders from all the countries of the region of the Americas. I think that is something relevant because as a follow-up and precisely because of the call of indigenous leaders in the region, a follow-up strategy and plan of action with specific indicators was approved. Um, the strategy goes from 2019 to 2025 and member states of the Americas are reporting on the advances throughout this period on how those indicators are improving for um, indigenous peoples and members of other groups. I would probably also mention that in the field of maternal health, there has been a very successful experience. Uh, the tool for promoting culturally safe childbirth, which was developed by indigenous women, midwives, uh, health personnel, and experts on intercultural health to try to promote those intercultural maternal health facilities. Um, and also PAHO, the Pan-American Health Organization is promoting the work with knowledge dialogues uh, on a variety of health topics and right now being expanded worldwide. Uh, sister agencies like PAO, UNESCO have approached PAO to try to follow um, the same model, which promotes participation of indigenous peoples, actually putting them at the center and promoting any initiative from the beginning being designed by indigenous peoples, anything that affects their health. So currently we're working with uh, uh, tuberculosis, trachoma, and um, many other health-related topics. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. We are, in the interests of time, going to move into a Q&A. 
So we uh, didn't get to our fourth question um, around partnerships, um, but we may see some of that come up in the questions. So what I would like to do is to invite any members of our audience who have a question um, or a comment to come up to the microphone. And if you'd like to address your question to someone specifically, you may do so, or you can just offer it up generally. Do we have anyone in the audience who has a question or a comment for our panelists? Don't all rush up at once. Sure, sure, please. This is not really a question. It's both a question and a comment. Um, I, I, I probably look at this room and say I, I might be one of the people who come from a very remote area in, in Kenya. My name is Ramson Karamushu. And I'm also privileged, I, I would say privileged, because I was born not in hospital in the community, and my mother did not go to hospital to deliver, and also almost all, of, all my brothers and sisters. And uh, I, I, there is no doubt that um, in the area where I grew, uh, I have not gone to hospital until 2022 Ju Ju June when I went to hospital when I was suffering, suffering malaria. And I did not actually know because I was in town, I would have treated it in the community. So there is no doubt there is a lot of knowledge that we have around hubs uh, that we use in them to treat ourselves, and we know a lot, but it's also a very scary system as well when we are talking about DSI now, digital sequencing information. We have a lot of information, but we are worried to share because it's, it's our uh, cultural heritage as well. Uh, it's something that we value so much, and of course, we, we are also scared of giving it out all, and then we lose everything. At the same time, we are losing this knowledge because it's not, and it's not being regenerated. What scares me most is that our knowledge is also being criminalized, where we are being told not to practice all these ways in the community, and we are, we are, we are di discouraged so that we go to hospitals that are also far economically, like we don't afford and so many things. So what are we doing to try and at least bridge this gap? Because I think, to me, uh, at least where I come from, there is even like, some comments and policies that are coming out that you can be criminalized and you can be jailed, you can, so many things. What are we doing to, to see this? Right, thank you for the question. Does anyone on the panel feel compelled to speak to that? So you may not get an answer here today, oh, but that's I okay, can just thank reflect, you. I can just reflect on um, some thinking, like, about what he said, like sure, I appreciate please. what he said and his comment and I I feel close to what he's saying and my own people also. Um, but what we can do, that is why I was uh, talking previously about um, the example of people living in remote areas. We need the knowledge from there to be valued the workers from there, because when people are sick there, who are they uh, seeing first? There are, they have their own system, like we have our own <laughs> healthcare system. Um, maybe we, ca we don't call it such because it's not in the mainstream, but we need ourselves as peoples to value those ones. Um, yeah, it's not trendy. Our uh, in some areas, our youth don't trust anymore on our systems because of the colonization, because of uh, lack of esteem that was cultivated on them. But yeah, one of the solutions is on our own hands. No one will come and uh, do the job at uh, in our place. So we need as youth from. Uh, uh, Maasai, Sangware, or other communities, Tuareg, to uh, be proud of those knowledges and to use them and to um, 
to be interested on them and to document them, to contribute to document them. So that is on our hand. But there are also the state hands, like they have to, uh, as we said earlier, strengthen the healthcare system and strengthening it and making it welcoming for indigenous peoples. And that takes all the uh, opportunities that we shared like uh, having more indigenous healthcare workers trained, having accessibility, more funding, as uh, uh, already said by some of the fellows co-panelists, like more funding for indigenous healthcare system and dialogues, as uh, Sandra said, uh, dialogue between uh, knowledges and between uh, 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 systems, as uh, they call it in PAHO, the intercultural health. So these are some of the solutions that we have uh, to overcome to that. Uh, some are not on our hands. We have to advocate still. For, I, hopefully, the so, uh, MNC summit will reflect them in their conclusion. But some are in our hands, so we have to go back to our grandmas, uh, our aunties, and learn uh, what they did to give birth to <laughs> nice people like you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. You have a question, lovely. Please, there is time. Um, so most of us um, work in various policy areas, and those of us that work in health, um, we often will look for levers that we can use to try to push for the things that we're going for. And SDGs is something that we're trying to use as a policy lever more strongly. Um, so we were, since you're, you know, this is really your realm and you've all spoke at international um, platforms and related to the UN and, and we're wondering what, what do you do to, um, what would you say to those of us that are working at um, national level or even regional level in health? Um, how to use the SDGs as like a powerful tool to advocate for the types of um, distinctions-based or um, Métis-specific um, uh, investments in in our in our health priorities, but also just recognition of um, the priorities and and the kind of way forward that we're trying to go. So kind of just trying to leverage your international lens and how we can like leverage that to use it towards our work at the national level. Thank you. That's a big question. Wow. Uh, we have time. We have time for uh, one long answer or two short answers on that. Do we have a panelist who would like uh, to speak? Yes, uh, Dr. Abukreni, you have your hand up if you have time for a short answer. Yeah, very short answer because I want you to also listen, uh, hear more per perspective so it gives another answer, another short answer. So, um, yeah, using how can we use the SDGs? We know that the SDGs has um, a strong uh, message of not leaving no one behind. So that in itself really don't is a great um, slogan to not leave any way, including indigenous peoples, right? So that's first. Now, the second thing is the new approach in the SDGs compared to MDGs is that we are, they are thinking about sustainability that includes people and planet health, mm. right? So that's another one. And that's really um, join indigenous holistic approach to health. Thirdly, when we come to specifically SDG3, which is the SDG on health, right? Uh, we cannot uh, report back because all the states report uh, on voluntary basis uh, on how they have been implementing the SDGs. And when they are reporting on SDG3, they have to say what has been done um, uh, at all levels, so they are preparing that voluntary national review at the state level, and we need to um, reflect our health system, how we have been uh, including indigenous peoples also in the health system. So we receive, the states receive um, 
input from indigenous organizations. I'm sure that uh, uh, Development Social Canada should be in the room or around because they have been the ones leading for Canada. And for the other countries, I think it's close to that. So th we need to, uh, it's an opportunity to feed that and there are close steps to report for accountability. So that is why I really see SDGs as a very great opportunity that we shouldn't miss as indigenous peoples or people working on policy for not leaving no one behind. Wonderful, wonderful answer, wonderful question. And um, we are going to leave it there. Um, I'm sorry, I always want to apologize at the end of these wonderful talks. We, I feel like we never have enough time to hear more from our panelists who have such wonderful depths of knowledge and, and, uh, and information to share with us. And also because I, I think that questions and comments just naturally come. So um, what I would invite um, is if our four panelists are able to stick around for two or three more minutes, just in case members of our audience do want to approach with a question or a comment, um, you can do that. Um, and um, we will be wrapping up in here in the next few moments and moving back into the main room for a 10 minute wrap up of the day. All right, so thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank you to our doctors who are virtual. It's not easy to be virtual in these moments, but thank you for giving us your, your presence today and sticking with us. Um, it's been a, a real pleasure to hear from you and see you today, so thank you very much. And thanks to all of you, and I'll see you next door in the big room in a few moments.